Welcome back to Chip Chat, More Rock Radio 91.5. Jim Costa, Brad Tunney, very special guest joining us in studio. It's head football coach John Bonamigo. Coach, appreciate you joining us. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome to be here. Thank you. Well, spring practice starting up, and uh, you finally get to take the dream job and uh, start coaching these guys. It has been a dream, and uh, I'm, I can just honestly tell you that I'm enjoying every single second of it. And, uh, you know, after being around these guys, watching them in our fourth quarter program, how hard they work, uh, and seeing them really embrace everything that we've asked of them, it's finally good to see them uh, out on the practice field executing our offense, our defensive schemes, and starting to put in our kicking game stuff as well. Well, Coach, you, you talked a little bit about stuff that they're starting to embrace. What were a couple of the initial, I guess, basic building blocks that you were trying to instill in the first couple practices? Well, you know, obviously, offensively, at least terminology-wise, there hasn't been a great change there, uh, you know, keeping Coach Watts on. So they're a little bit ahead. Uh, Coach Colby putting in his defense, uh, that's been an adjustment a little bit. But our, our guys have really embraced it. Really, in spring practice, you're – you know, and we've had two non-padded days, which you get to see a little bit, but uh, it's really when you start to see that, you know, get the pads on, you get to see really what you have. Um, but different things that you really want to emphasize are, you know, we're trying to reduce the things that hurt ourselves, you know, so really we're tracking uh, missed assignments, uh, pre-snap penalties, um, you know, interceptions, fumbles, those type of things. Those, those are the things that lose games for you. So uh, we're making a very concentrated effort to chart those things, emphasize it. We're talking about it every single day. And, uh, you know, we're really actually plotting those out and graphing those and, and showing it to them as a team every single day so we can see, you know, we want to see the, obviously the MAs, we want to see those trend down. Uh, we we want to see pre-snap penalties trending down. And then, you know, when it comes to turnovers, uh, you, there's give and take, you know. I mean, uh, as a head coach, I learned quickly, it's like you're excited when the offense makes a big play, but then you want to know what happened on defense, too, especially <laughs> when you're going against one another. So uh, it, it, it has been, it's been fun. It's been awesome. We got three down. There's 12 to go, one of those being the spring game. And... Uh, you know, I just wish we could just keep on going. <laughs> well, yeah, the spring game is going to be April 25th for folks that want to come out. That's going to be 1 o'clock a Saturday. You talked about some unpadded practices. How does it lay out if you could break it down for us? When do you get the pads on, and then when do you start to ramp well, it up? Well, you know, the NCAA is very specific in terms of the number of non-padded and padded days that you are required to have. So uh, the first two practices have to be non-padded. So those are, just, are essentially helmet shorts practices. There's one more of those, uh, which is going to be this Friday, which is Good Friday, as we all know. And uh, we, we're not normally practicing on Friday, but we want to give the players an opportunity to get home for, uh, for Easter. Mm -hmm. So that day, that last non-padded day, is really going to be a heavy uh, kicking game emphasis day. So it'll be uh, a lot of special teams. We won't keep them on the field as long. Um, but then the rest of them pretty much lay out where it's you know, we're Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, with the Saturdays being quote unquote scrimmage days. Um, you know, you're always monitoring, you want to monitor the health of your team. And it's kind of, you know, you decide, pick and choose which periods in practice you want to tackle and which ones you just want to thud up. Talk about the spring game and obviously spring practices kind of culminate at the end with that. Spring I got to say this, you have you guys have awesome radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't you have know, a bad one yourself. Yeah, well, you. I'm I'm fighting a cold right now, I'm a little bit <laughs> hoarse, but but you know they could plug you guys in anywhere in the country right now. Nobody would know you were still college students. So. <laughs> we, we, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. <laughs> the spring game is something that has a lot of different formats, and I know Michigan has come out and said that they're going to do a little bit of a draft, and I know Central Michigan has done that in years past. What kind of format do you guys kind of see it taking? That's, that's how I envision it. I envision us uh, splitting the coaching staff up uh, and uh, assigning some senior leadership and then having a draft. In terms of the format of the game, um, you know, we kind of evaluate that as we go through spring practice. That's going to be, again, determined on, you know, the health of our team. We want to make sure we get everybody through injury-free and that sort of thing. But uh, one of the things that we are going to do that will give it a little bit of a twist, I think, is we're going to give it, uh, 
we're going to use the Pro Bowl, the Pro Bowl uh, format. So there'll be a, a change of possession at the end of each quarter. So uh, you know, the end of each quarter will be a you know a two-minute drill, so to speak. So uh, you know, that's one of the things we're looking at uh, in terms of the length of the quarters, running clocks, you know, that sort of thing. We're going to we'll kind of play that by ear. Talking with Coach Bonamigo, head coach for Central Michigan football. He's going to have his first season uh, starting spring practice up right now. And I think one big thing you talked about it, the switch of the defense to a 4-3 now with Coach Colby. Personnel-wise, it's a lot of defensive backs, and now you guys have to get more linebackers just out there. What are some of the challenges that come with that switch? Uh, you know, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, a lot of that is really um, more semantics than anything okay. else. I think there's times where, you know, the strength of this defense as we evaluated it and came in really was the defensive line. That was the group that had the most depth. If we were we were thin anywhere right now, it's a little bit concerned about uh, the number of players we had in the secondary and uh, or just healthy players at this point in time. So uh, I don't think it's that big of a switch. I mean, you are what you are. You know, whoever was going to be in, it was going to be somebody different. So. You know, Joe Tumpkin left, so you know you can't ask somebody to come in and put someone else's defense in. Right. So uh, I've always been kind of a proponent of the four-three. I like that. I mean, you take out one linebacker and you put in a DB, and now you're really in a what four-two-five. It's a nickel. Right. It's again, it's it's kind of it's it, it's really what you call people. You know, offensive and defensive football. It's when you really look at it. There are very pure, there are very few pure hybrids out there. You know, everybody is, everybody's kind of a, a mixture of a lot of different things. Talking about the defense, flip the ball on the other side to the offense. You have a quarterback in Cooper Rush who was a lead starter last year as a sophomore, now moving into his junior season. Mm -hmm. What have your been his or your opening impressions about him so far? You know, I love him. Yeah. You know, everything about him, uh, just how he carries himself. I told someone on, uh, I don't even love his red hair. You know? <laughs> uh, no, very poised, great arm, uh, excellent command of the offense, uh, very diligent worker, uh, has a great relationship with, uh, with Morse Watts. I mean, those two are on the same wavelength. Uh, I'm really excited, him, excited to see him uh, this fall. Uh, he's picked up the no huddle stuff. We've started to work that package. We call it our, our NASCAR package so we can, you know, we can jump into no huddle at any point in time. And uh, he's really got a very, very good command of that. I expect that just to improve as everyone else grasps that around him as well. Well, Coach, I'm interested in the way that the offense is going to shape it. I don't even know if you guys really know exactly what the end game is going to be, but you're talking about mixing stuff, taking stuff from different schemes and styles. You set up tempo with the opening presser. Could you elaborate a little more on the vision of what you see this team doing offensively? Um, you know, you're going to see a base stable of runs, and then you're going to see uh, a, a wide variety of pass concepts. Again, you're going to you have you have screens, draws mixed in there. Uh, we're going to use the tight end. We'll be in two back. We'll be in one back. We have tight ends that can split out and uh, you know stress a defense. You know, we'll be able to spread out and run. You know spread people out and then be able to run the ball inside and and you know there'll be you know there'll be a lot of checks in terms of run to run or or pass to run run to pass uh it really depending on on uh how people line up against you uh you know the ability to go no huddle uh you could play the whole game that way you could signal in uh, with wristbands uh I think that you've got to be able to run the football. I really believe that you have to run the ball, especially when you get into tight games, late in games. And, you know, uh, we, we talked about four minute offense um, uh, this past Saturday. And, and we had a period of that where, you know, you know that you got to get that defensive coordinator, the head, co head coach on the opposite sideline to use their timeouts. And you have to, you have to be able to run the ball in those situations to get it down to where you can just kneel it and seal a victory in those tight games. So uh, different paces uh, in different places is really what it is. So um, you're going to see a lot of that. You're going to see the ball spread out to a lot of different people. And um, 
you know, in our conference in college football today, you have to be able to score points. You have to be able to keep pace with people. Something that I, uh, I was curious about when you, when you were hired coach is this idea of Bono gear that you had in the NFL that you <laughs> carried with you. I was very curious on what it was because it was something that we didn't really see pictures of online or anything. Is it more well, of just something that you assigned to players or is it actually gear? Here, here, here's how it started off. It, it's, I'll try to give you the cliff notes. <laughs> um, I came up with a mantra when I was still in college football uh, called Free Hurt. And what Free Hurt is, is pain, physical, emotional, is the only thing that anyone ever gives you that's truly free. There's a lot of things that people will pass off as free, mm -hmm. but it always has a hidden hook. There's a price tag associated to that. So when I became a coordinator in the NFL, um, I started to get shirts printed up that said free hurt on them. And um, players were able to earn those through things that they did on the field. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when you got to five special teams tackle, you got the black shirt. When you got to 10, you got the matching hat. You know, if you had 15 blocks in the return game, you got the white shirt. And when you got to 30, you got the matching hat. And then we had knockdowns, which was gray, you know, same thing. So if you're really doing well, now you get a whole wardrobe, you can mix and match <laughs> your stuff. But the idea of it was that you couldn't buy it anywhere. It's not for sale. It was made specifically for those guys uh, that earned it. And so it was a badge of honor to, to, to acquire that gear. And, uh, you know, it worked for a long time in the NFL. Guys that make hundreds of thousands, some case millions of dollars, you know. It's a little added something. Yeah, it was yeah. a little added something that they could get. And so um, that's really what that was all about. It was just more kind of... Per things that keep it competitive. You're dealing with competitive guys. Um, everyone wants to be recognized. So uh, a way to give them something that didn't have a lot of real material value, but a lot of sentimental value. And that said, hey, I did something. Probably allowed them to compete against each other. Guys Absolutely. like that, like you said, make millions of dollars. Yeah, and I, mean, I, got the, I got the 30 tackle hat yeah, from Bono. A, a, an elite competitor yeah. is never afraid to compete. And that's one of the things that we talk about in our with our team is that if you can keep score, we're gonna keep score, we're gonna compete. So even in our winter conditioning drills, if you were in the locker room right now, you'll see a chart. So whenever two players were going head to head in any of our drill work, we started, we started charting who was winning and then we posted in the locker room and every time a new chart came up, you would see the guys walk by, you know? So mm -hmm. when you're a competitor, you're gonna compete all the time. And I tell them, hey man, if you're playing checkers with your grandma, she needs to be ready to lose. So uh, it, that's what it's all about. That's what we want. And, and, you know, competition within the team is is excellent. It's healthy. It's it's good. It's guys pushing one another uh, to be the very best that they can be. So who's winning most of these? You say you're charting them. Who um, stands out? <laughs> I'm not going to say right now. <laughs> But that's they know who they are. Well, that, and that's that is fair. A lot of a lot of you guys learn when the pads come on, really, who goes to that sure. next level too, though, right? Sure. And it's and, and we'll do the same thing in the games. We'll we'll chart tackles. You know, we'll chart who's the first one down on kickoff. You know, we'll keep keep track of who who blocks kicks, who how, who has the most pancakes on the offensive line. We'll we'll you know that stuff's all it's fun, it's healthy, and again, it's great. And and you want to recognize guys for for performing well. So you've been all over the place, and we've seen you at different businesses, and you've been out and about. I think you've done a nice job really getting to know everybody in the community. How much of that is you have to do that as a head coach in 2015? You have to be able to connect with so many alums and fans and, and different people because it seems like that really resonates with you. Well, I'm a people person. This is a people business. And, um, you know, Paulette uh, and I really like to get out, you know, we and – uh, right now we're in Keywaden Apartments, so we're not cooking anything. And I always <laughs> joke with her. I said, the thing that she makes best is reservations. So, <laughs> you know, w we get out to eat. You know, and that's that's, uh, you know, we, we do that, and and we just we enjoy meeting people. Uh, you know, I've uh, you know I've really enjoyed. We have both enjoyed not just meeting, you know, our student athletes from across the board, but but the regular students, it's, it's awesome. And, and that's what CMU is all about. And I say that to recruits, I say that to parents, that 
institutions, places, they're just dots on a map, right? It's a, you know, it's a coordinate latitude, longitude, and, and, you know, these buildings are all brick and mortar. It's the people that you come in contact every single day. It's the, you know, it's the students in the hallways. It's the professors in the classrooms. It's, you know, it's the people out in the town. That's what makes a place special. And, um, you know, that's what makes us unique. That's what's made CMU always a great place to be. And, uh, you know, I, I can't express enough how excited I am to move my family back here. Like you said, you know, we've been all over the place. And everywhere we've been, we, whether it was, you know, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Jacksonville, Florida, or, you know, in New Orleans, six months removed from, from Katrina, we've always been able to connect with people and, um, and uh, build relationships that, and friendships that we still carry on today. And, and that's important to us. It's, it's not fabricated. It's just who we are. And it's such a big key in the coaching landscape. When we were both at the post or at the press conference after you were hired, and the one word that we both took from that was engagement and how you were able to engage everybody. I think it's such a great quality that you have bringing to this campus. But you said the best thing that Paulette has done so far is the reservations that she's made. Where, <laughs> where is it more so than not that she's making those reservations? Well, to we've in the tried area? to hit all of the spots around yeah. town. I mean, we've, uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to slight anybody, you know, but we've, you know, we've hit a couple places several times and, uh, you know, um, but we've, uh, you know, we really run, enjoy the, you know, was it Brass Cafe, uh, uh, Mountain Town, yep. yeah. um, Kubota, is that, am I saying Kadoba? that? Kadoba. Kadoba. Yep, we've been spot. there a couple of times, <laughs> you know, uh, we were actually there on uh, Friday evening. Um, I mean, the cabin, you know, You've hit up all the local Yeah, spots. you've been so everywhere. We, we've been to the Mount, you know, is it uh, Hunter's Ale House? Uh -huh. I mean, that's that's a favorite. We were there yesterday. <laughs> you know, I love their pretzel buns. <laughs> uh, if you haven't had one, have one. <laughs> There's no endorsement. That one was that was a free endorsement. <laughs> you know, but I really I, I like their burger. You know, uh, it's funny right. because the first two weeks I probably lost about 15 pounds because. I didn't have time to eat. Right, <laughs> right. And then in the last three weeks, I think I've gained that back plus 15. So I got to get on the treadmill. Uh, Coach, I mean, we were talking a little bit about the team. I'm and loving you guys the uh, lead-in music, too, by the way. It's <laughs> back from my era. <laughs> well, and you're, you're, you're a student here, and I'm sure you've got some interesting stories now that you're back. Some of the memories flow I'm back. I'm just lucky there weren't cell phones with cameras back then. Do you have any stories boy. you could share? Any stories? Goofy, funny? What was Bono Most, like back when you were here? I, I, you know what? Bono was big. <laughs> Bono was just getting on this on the scene. That was, I didn't get my Bono nickname until after, well after that. I thought I was you were actually, the first. Well, I'm, <laughs> I, well, I say he's you too. I'm me too. Right. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, the Bono moniker came at University of Maine. Uh, with my first year as a GA, I worked for a guy named John Lovett, who's with the Philadelphia Eagles right now, and I was, I was his GA, and, and he just started calling me Bono, and it stuck, you know. What have, you talked about Cooper Rush a little bit and how impressive he's been. What are some other things that have been really impressive with this group so far? I think the way they work. You know, I, I think it felt like coming in, watching them the very first, you know, the, the Tuesday morning after the, after the press conference. I was just impressed on how hard they worked and, uh, and how much they pull for one another. And, uh, you know, Jason Novak, the strength coach that we brought in, who's – outstanding uh has has said that as well that you know they've got a very good work ethic they enjoy being around one another they they push one another and pull pull for one another and uh, that made me feel really good and then you know you know you kind of watch it as a coach and then you're expecting maybe that there'd be a dip or a fall off you know thinking that maybe it was just the first day but but i, I never i never saw that uh, I, I saw it actually ramp up. Uh, I saw them uh, go to a different way of training with a new strength coach and really embrace that and uh, even put more in. And uh, that's been really impressive to me. 
Well, impressive. Speaking of impressive, you coming in here, I think looking at your resume, some of the different places you've been, uh, some of the NFL coaches that you've worked with and around Jim Caldwell and, and even Sean Payton and stuff, who are some of the coaches that have had sort of the biggest influence on your coaching career? I've been really blessed that, that you know, I've been around a lot, a lot of guys. And um, I think you take something from anybody and everyone that you're around, you know, and it's not just head coaches. Um, if I was going to say the one person that had the biggest impact on me, it wouldn't even be another head coach. It would be would have been Frank Gans Sr., who, you know, was head coach for the Kansas City Chiefs for a couple years, uh, had a 25 year career as a NFL assistant, uh, Naval Academy grad, uh, coached at all three uh, service academies. And Coach Gans, uh, you know, I worked with him as his assistant for two years and really changed the way I saw the game. And uh, a lot of what I teach and how I teach in terms of from a, from a fundamental standpoint uh, traces directly back to him. But, you know, to be around someone like Tom Coughlin, you know, and even Dom Capers, who is our defense coordinator in Jacksonville, you know, to work on a staff with uh, Gary Moeller. Gary was on a st uh, staff with us or Dan Henning in Miami, uh, to be around Bill Parcells, uh, to be with Sean Payton and watch him uh, every day and how he prepared. Um, Jim Caldwell, you know, just Jim, uh, Coach Caldwell, a uh, huge, huge impact on me because he got me to cut down how much I sweared. <laughs> so that was a good thing. But, but Jim, you know, uh, Jim's attention to detail and how he spoke to the team how he treated the players, how he got them to uh, really buy and embrace the values that he was teaching and, and got them to recognize that they represent more than that just themselves and uh, how he kind of uh, every day just hit on character and how important that was and got, those, got a group of guys to buy into that. Huge, huge, huge impact. Uh, you know, Mike Sherman in Green Bay, um, the attention to detail, uh, you know, the situational preparedness, uh, again, how he managed people and how he held people accountable. Uh, just a lot of great, a lot of great, um, a lot of great lessons there, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, I was on staff with James Franklin. You know, James and I were assistants together in Green Bay. And I worked, uh, you know, worked with Mark Duffner, who was on two different staffs. Duff was, you know, wildly successful at uh, Holy Cross for a lot of years. Uh, you know, I got a long list of guys that I've been on staffs with that have been head coaches at a lot of different places. And honestly, that was one of the things that, that really kept motivating me. You know, um, I have a list in my in my iPhone and in my notes section of head coaches that I've worked for and then, you know, former or current head coaches that I've worked with, you know, and that that second list is a lot longer. And, you know, you always measure yourself if you're a competitor, you say, gosh, you know, if this guy can do it, I've been around him, you know, I, I should be able to do it too. And so uh, that's kind of one of the things that drives you. And I think that's something that not maybe the average student here or the average fan realizes how many of these great names that you've been able to work with, able to pluck a new thing from each of those guys to bring into your own coaching style. And you kind of let us into your, our next question. You almost knew what we were taking this show already. You talk about Jim Caldwell and the culture change for him last season with the Lions, all of us being Lions fans here. Uh, what were some of the different things that you were able uh, to work with there with Jim Caldwell? And then also maybe a guy like Matthew Stafford, rumors out recently about his work ethic. Kind of take us inside the locker room potentially w in Detroit. Well, you know, I think everybody em emphasizes the same things. You know, and uh, Jim Schwartz certainly did a, a good job there. I mean, uh, when you look at where Jim, where that team was when he came in and then where it was, it went from uh, a franchise where no one expected them to win to now at a place where it, people are expecting them to contend for a division title each year. You know, Jim, Jim Schwartz did a great job. I, I think what was different was, was Coach Caldwell's delivery, you know, and the things that he emphasized. Um, 
and frankly a lot of things that I'm trying to impress upon our guys right now about not beating yourself you know uh, eliminating emphasizing you know winning the turnover battle uh, you know being a mistake free, free uh, team not hurting yourself with pre-snap or you know foolish penalties penalties are going to happen but if you can minimize those as much as you can and then taking care of the football you know don't give people other don't give people possessions and then trying to take it away on defense playing a very fast aggressive swarming ball attacking opportunistic style of defense you know those are the things that he kind of hammered home every single day and did a great job also of team building and and really building confidence and expectations within that locker room that's a you know that's a big part of you know what a head coach does and then it's important for the assistants to kind of take that message and move it forward and, and you know that was as my role as a special teams coordinator I always viewed that as that was a big deal because other than the head coach I was the only other person that had them all of them every single day and there was a lot of times I could talk to him in a way that he couldn't but I was always trying to hammer home and reinforce the uh, the lessons and the message that he was trying to preach so it's interesting the, the big Lions offseason topic I'd like to get your thoughts on it because you were a part of that organization <laughs> the Indomitian Sioux stuff I mean it mm -hmm. dominated our news cycle we talked about right. it on the show a whole bunch what was your vibe on that? I mean, the way they handled it. Did he want to be there? I mean, I, I'd like to glean a little bit from you, someone who, who was around him. I think um, I think Andomican enjoyed his time in Detroit. If you look at that season-ending press conference, you know, where he, he was in tears, you, you got a chance to see in a quick snapshot how much he cares about the game and how much he cared about his teammates. And, and like I said earlier, you know, Detroit's just like Mount Pleasant. It, it, these franchises, they're all different, but it's the people in the building. It's, you know, and that's the tough thing for a player, you know, or a coach. When you change jobs, you know, you have to make a decision in a very, very small window. And you don't, a lot of times, have the luxury to really know, you know, what's in that locker room. Who are the people I'm going to go to work with? Uh, ultimately, you know, I think money talks, you know, yeah. and and I think, uh, you know, I, I think Detroit, I think the Lions uh, did everything that they could, but they just couldn't, you know, keep pace with probably what, you know, Miami was willing to to invest in Indomitian. And I know he has a lot of uh, uh, outside interests, you know, that he's trying to set himself up for after football, uh, being in a larger market, media market, I think for him, uh, made sense for what he wants to do and uh, you know but the bottom line is always you know the dollars you know and and you can't blame a guy these these guys have a very you know uh, narrow window in which to make that money uh, you know professional athletics it's like it can be gone like that you know in one day and uh, you know so I certainly appreciate respect the fact that a guy uh, wants to get as much as he can. The only thing we ask for him is, you know, show up on time and work as hard as you can, you know, be a good teammate. And, and Dominican was all of those things. You know, I, you know, I really have a, a high opinion of him. A highly, highly intelligent guy, you know. Um, I think the, the way he's portrayed and what he really is is, you know, very different. I think, uh, I think he got a little gun shy because of some of that publicity early on and I think that had him you know he kind of pulled back a little bit which is you know I'm not gonna say that's the right or wrong thing to do but uh, I think that that further you know uh, that further you know kind of continued how people saw him and uh, you know but but when you get to know him you know you know, he's a great guy to have in the locker room. He's a great, uh, great guy to coach, great teammate. A couple minutes left here, Coach, with you, and want to allow you to kind of have this forum. Western Michigan, a rivalry here on campus. You were a part of it as a student. You get mm -hmm. to be a part of it now as the head coach. Any uh, rallying cries yet to get the students <laughs> going, to get ready for Western Michigan I next season? I want our students in the fan. I, I want them in the stands for every game, uh -huh. you know. We're going to play them in Kalamazoo this year, but, you know, we got to get – CMU, we got to get Kelly Short Stadium back to where, you know, it used to be, where we know it can be. And 
my job and our team's job is to put a product on the field that's worthy of your loyalty, worthy of your fandom. But, you know, we, you guys, you know, you guys provide such a spark for our team and, and it transcends more than just game day. It affects recruiting. It affects how Central Michigan is viewed across the board as a university for student athletes and non and just regular students, you know, alone, you know, that are just looking at CMU. So, you know, I, I plan to be further engaged and, uh, and I'm going to get put myself out there and I just want to see you in the stands. I just want to see you in the stands and I want to hear you, you know, and uh, I promise you if you guys support us, we will, we will make you proud.